Good morning, my, or sorry, good afternoon. My name is Shira Gans and I'm the Senior Executive Director of Policy Programs at the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. I'm so excited that you're joining us today for New York Music Month Extended Play. It's an initiative that our office has done every year since 2017 in June. This year in the pandemic, we expanded it and have been kicking it off since January. So I'll put in the chat. You can check out all the programs that we've done to date. They're all available. Everything we've recorded, we have resources for musicians like this, youth programming, New York Music Month talks that dig into different industry topics and performances and workshops. So today I'm super excited that we have Riggs Morales joining us from Atlantic. He's the SVP of a &R over there and has an amazing career. And today he's here to kind of take you through the art of music development and answer some questions at the end. So I'm gonna turn it over to Riggs. And there we go. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you, Shira, right? Am I, am I pronouncing this right? I wanna make sure I'm getting this right. Is it Shira, yeah, Shira? Shira. <laughs> Shira, awesome. Thank you, Shira. Um, happy to be here. Um, um, you know, I, this is a bit unconventional for me. Normally, um, in a case like this, I, uh, it's normally driven, it looks like, uh, it's written by, by, uh, Q and A's. So what I'll do is this, I'm going to give you guys a quick, uh, five minute breakdown of, uh, myself and my career and what have you. And then from there, if something on here, uh, if something within this journey that I share with you. Uh, happens to resonate, jot it down because uh, you might have a question regarding it and uh, I might be able to provide some perspective. I've been in the business for close to 20 some odd years now, a very quick 20 some odd years. And um, I've, I've seen so many things and just been involved in so many aspects of an artist's uh, development that, um, you know, it takes a village. So um, I've been able to see things from different departments and just, just being able to just see the wonderful process that is development. I know a lot of people wonder, is artist development, is that still a thing? Yeah, it actually is a thing. There's a, there's a slew of artists that have been benefited from artist development. Uh, you have someone like, I just spoke about The weekend recently. The weekend was someone who, you know, started off with a mixtape and evolved over the course of a few mixtapes. And then finally, once he established this one sound and made a conscious effort to go to the next level, he aligned himself with the right producer that in turn gave us Feel My Face and turned him into an international superstar and the crossover star that everyone always envisioned. Uh, development doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. Uh, another recent example is Lizzo. I remember early on Lizzo would just be throughout the hallways of Atlantic Records and, and just like that energy that the public now gets to see, we would see it in real time, but we knew all it took was one song or moment to take it to the next level. Um, Bruno Mars is another one. Bruno Mars is one where you know, was when he first got signed to Atlantic, to my understanding, was sleeping in, in, in folks' couches as he developed the sound and, and, and waited for the right opportunity. So I've always said it's easy to get signed. It's another, it's, it's much more difficult to actually get them to, to put the music out uh, and get a release. So um, with that, uh, I started in the music business in 95. Um, I started as an intern at the Source Magazine, this wonderful, amazing uh, I mean, music magazine, a hip hop magazine that at the time was responsible for just really capturing the culture of hip hop in a way that that's never been done. This is before the internet, before radio had hip hop, before anybody was able to give, be given information on what's going on in hip hop. It was our jobs as music journalists to report what was going on to an entire country. I spent five wonderful years there. I always had aspirations of being an a and &R. What's an a and &R? A and r my job is to find, sign, and develop music acts. My job uh, I am part of the process from the beginning when they're, you know, started from the bottom all the way to they get to that point where they're selling uh, a slew of records uh, 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 and being certified platinum after platinum after platinum and you guys end up knowing about them. So um, that requires a little bit of foresight, uh, requires a lot of belief and an enormous amount of patience um, from everyone involved. Uh, when I saw what the term A&R was, uh, A&R, uh, it was Puff Daddy. 
Puff Daddy was, in my opinion, one of the best CNR men in music. And at the time, he was going through a run. That run was Biggie, Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, a bunch of legends now that to this day, the music continues to play. And I found out that someone got paid to go out and find new music acts. And that spoke to me um, because I, for one, such a music person, all I did was just buy music. And I always found myself loving the records on the albums that I would buy that would eventually become singles. So I'm like, oh, so I used to be you know, privately proud, like, oh, that's one of my favorite records. And now it's all over the radio as the second or third single, which means that I had a bit of, a, of an acumen for, for, hot, for, for catching what can actually work uh, for an artist uh, as a single. That's a whole other, that's a whole other um, thing. Uh, in order for me to prove that I was going to be a good A&R, uh, I had to earn the trust of the people that I got to, the, 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 the people at the music magazine, my editors. There was a column called Unsigned Hype. It was a legendary column. That column, if, if, if someone wrote about you in that column, there was a likelihood you were either going to get a call from a label or a deal from a record label. Some of the past uh, legends from that column were DMX, rest in peace, Biggie, rest in peace, uh, Mob Deep, uh, Common, um, and a slew of other, uh, of other, go on, other stars who went on to be massive superstars in, in the hip hop space. So I knew that that would have to be my portfolio. I had to you know, get, get, be trusted enough to get my hands on that column. And from there I can show whether or not I'm actually good at this A&R thing. Uh, by the time I was done with my wonderful five year run at the Source Magazine, um, I was, I uh, had highlighted artists such as Cardinal Official, uh, Joel Santana, who went on to do some great things, and most notably Eminem. Uh, and Eminem, this was about two years before he came on, on Dr. Dre's radar, probably two, two and a half years. But in any case, um, that panned out pretty well. So well, in fact, that when I decided to leave the music business from, a, from a, the journalist, the, 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 the writing business, uh, as a music journalist, I went off to work for Eminem. Uh, we went to Shady Records, where I spent 12 wonderful years there working on albums, including 8 Mile, 50 Cent, Get Rich or Die Trying, um, and a lot of the, the, the milestone releases coming out of the, uh, coming out of the label during that time period. And uh, in 2013, 2014, I made a transition. I wanted to go to a broader level and just go beyond just hip hop. And uh, I got an opportunity to go work at Atlantic Records, which is a legendary record label that is responsible for some of the best R&B music uh, in, in history, uh, rock as well, just music in general. Uh, and it was there that I really got a chance to broaden out beyond just hip hop. So while at Atlantic, I oversee artists such as Wiz Khalifa, I oversee Action Bronson, uh, I oversaw Jordan Lucas, I oversaw OT Genesis, uh, Travi McCoy from Gym Class Heroes, and then most notably uh, the Hamilton Project, which has done quite well, not only for the company, but has become like a big cultural moment that, um, you know, quite honestly is just beyond anything any of us had, had ever imagined. Um, and here I am, um, going through 20 some odd years of, of history that I'm just willing to, to give back to folks. Because um, I think that, you know, the perception of the music business is that you is just an artist. Uh, you want to be a writer, you want to be a, a singer, you want to be you know, a producer. There's the creative aspect of it, but folks don't realize that it, it does take a village. It takes about close to 20 people to work one particular record because you have different departments that are all running on all cylinders to make sure that you hear this record on the streaming platforms, on the radio, see it on television and make sure that it's, it's, it's positioned in a place where you're listening to it, which is not an easy thing to do when you consider that about 40 to 60,000 new songs are uploaded, uh, I believe monthly uh on all the streaming platforms that you all go to whether it's youtube whether it's spotify whether it's titles so um yeah there's a lot of opportunity in the music business and i encourage folks to really look into it because you are the ones that keep the ecosystem running you are the ones that are going to end up finding developing and working with some of the the, the new artists uh, of our generation so pardon me one second while i just put this on
think I made that work. Awesome. Cool. So um, I'm wondering if there's any questions that some of the good folks on here may have. I know there's a chat room on the side. Shout out to anybody on here. Mr. Morales conducted a he calls the challenge of attention. Ah. Okay, I see a question about internships. It's pretty interesting because that's uh that was my entry point. I started as an intern. And I found internships are so, so important because that not only presents an opportunity, but it also presents uh, your chance to really show whether or not um, this is something for you, this being the business or just whatever path you take. Um, with interns, uh, one of my peeves with interns is uh, interns that aren't um, proactive. I think there's a sense of uh, when interns come and start at the company, they just sit at the desk and just kind of wait for people to give them an assignment. Um, for me, when I was an intern and what I've seen commonly with some of the really good interns are very proactive. They run around asking, do you need anything? Is there anything I could do to help? What you want to do as an intern is make yourself valuable at any level, whether it's an intern or just moving on up. You want to make yourself valuable to the system, to the company, to whoever it is that you're reporting to. Um, I remember as an intern, you know, um, if I had to go get the cleaners, I go get the cleaners. Um, in my case, I had to listen to a refrigerator box filled with demos, cassette demos, which was about the size of a size of a mouse, if that. And um, of course, a refrigerator box is pretty heavy, it's pretty big. So, um, but that's really where you know you 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 really get to you test your metal. Um, and uh, internships. Um, I don't, I don't know how they're, how they're approached in this day and age, because um, if they were, um, if they were approached correctly, I should be able to see you from the time you internship down the line. Um, I have a, a uh, I normally any hirings that I do, um, I'm paying close attention to the interns, because if the intern doesn't have an opportunity, if, 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 say, for example, the intern doesn't find an opportunity at the place where they're currently employed, if this intern made an impression on me, I'm going to recommend that intern for another situation, another opportunity elsewhere, because I was very impressed with what he or she ended up doing. And I do that a lot. I pay close attention to the interns, not only the ones that work under my department, but some of the other ones and some of the go-getters. And I even ask, because again, the ecosystem of this business is built around that kind of new energy, that new passion for music. So um, that, those, are my, uh, those are my thoughts. Let's see, uh, regarding internships. So I hope, uh, I hope that was answered. Uh, what's the best way for new artists to get on your radar with minimal following? No way. Unfortunately, um, this is a very flooded music market. So you're really gonna have to work hard to make sure it gets on my radar and gets to my attention. Um, most labels now are very reliant on data. They are very reliant on research. So if, you're having, if you are having some sort of an effect, people will, it will come on our radar. But just bear in mind that would mean the amount of traction that you that you ought to have to get to our our to get to, on our radar is has to be really substantial, really really substantial. So um, but see a question like that: What's the best way for new artists to get on your radar with minimal following? That's that's um, it's tricky because it's just like like the one of the first questions they're gonna ask you is how are your followers? You know, how many followers do you have? How engaged are you on social media? And you can't always bank and base, you know, your interests or the success of someone based off that. Ultimately, the music dope sells itself, as I like to say. Like, if it's dope, it's going to sell itself. If it's hot, it's going to sell itself. Um, but people, other folks are going to look at those metrics and determine whether or not, because that's a pulse. Those numbers are a pulse that really show whether or not, you know, anybody's paying attention to you. So um, I would take that time period, instead of just focusing on the amount of likes that you have, continue, obviously. I would say go after one fan at a time 
And if you're not ready for that part of it, then you're not, you're not ready for the business. You got to do one fan at a time. Well, it takes one person to really like your music. And from there, spread the word and that word of mouth. And you get more followers and more followers. And in between time, you ought to try to build with like-minded folks. You ought to build with up-and-coming producers. If you're an up-and-coming singer, try to find yourself an up-and-coming producer. So that way you're both in the trenches together and you can learn from each other during this really key period. Because this is a key period where you try to find yourself. This entire process is about seven to 10 years, unfortunately. Um, for some people it's faster, but as fast as they get there is as fast as they're gone. Uh, we can go through a whole slew of folks that were popular on TikTok about a year ago and no longer exists. So um, uh, th those are just some some initial thoughts based off of um, based off the the, 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 the the minimal following. Let's see a couple of questions from me with a lot of new platforms for an artist to get their music out into the world. Why do you think it's important to be on a label. Very good question. So what you have now with this generation, you have the messaging going along the lines of you don't need a label, you don't need a label versus keep on your masters, own your masters. A friend and I, you know, kind of, you know, joke around like if you did have your masters, do you know what to do with them? So if you are going to go the independent route where you're going to own your masters, really do your research on how you really extract and maximize your masters, right? And in terms of being on a label versus being independent, Label resources are pretty vast, they're big. Um, and they definitely ideally are supposed to take you to another level. So, um, you know, the labels have different departments that have relationships with people that where your music is supposed to sit. So every record label has a, uh, has a representative that works in the digital department or in the sales department that go and pitch your music to the gatekeepers at Spotify, at Tidal and at YouTube. Like record labels provide that kind of massive resource. They also have branding departments. The branding departments are the ones that, you know, they ask you a slew of questions when you come in as an artist. What are your favorite sneakers? What are you into? And they try to find a nice partnership for you to get in conjunction, to, to, to have some synergy with. It could be a Converse, it could be a Nike, it could be, you know, a lemonade, uh, whatever it is that you're into. And if there's some sort of mutual, you know, benefit there between artists and brand, then a record label is able to make that work. So um, I hope that uh, that's just one of the many things that 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 a record label uh, ought to be providing for you. Um, in in uh, in 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 comparison to being indie. Now, if you're gonna go indie, you better have the right team around you. You want to make sure that you have smart people around you and that are ready for the grind. And when, when I say ready for the grind, you are going to reach a point where you are going to start second guessing yourself. You are going to start questioning whether or not this is even worth it. You're pouring money into something and things are just not moving along the way you want to. You're paying for this and you're paying for that and it's just not panning out. Like if you're not mentally prepared for the journey that is you breaking as an artist, you should really think about that early and maybe put your music loving energy towards somewhere else within the music business that'll allow you to, uh, to, to really just let off that passion for music. At the end of the day, most of the staff at labels are folks that are really, just really creative music people who just happen to be working in a different position. Some of them might've been aspiring singers. Some of them might've been aspiring rappers. Um, having that perspective as a creative is so valuable. Um, so just because you don't make it as an artist or as a creative, doesn't mean that there isn't other opportunities for you as a music lover. So let me see what we have here. Do you have any strategies you can share about how artists get traction? Is it producing content on TikTok? Is it about sharing personal content? That's a good question. I think um, every artist has to have something that is compelling. There has beyond just the music. Unfortunately, we're in an era now where um, it's kind of more narrative than music, uh, instead of it being music and narrative. I saw you have so much audacity uh, throughout some of today's artists where they'll do something that just, they just want you to talk about them. And if you're talking about them, that leads to you going out and just streaming and just really doing your research and they just got themselves a couple more streams off that. So um, you can, Use the, the, you can use the popular platforms like a TikTok, you can use a Twitch, you can use, you know, a YouTube or whatever the platforms are, but 
you know, you, whatever it is, you want to try to stand out from the rest. How you go about that is on you as an artist, whether or not you want to do some, some chicanery, or if you want to go about it in a way where that wonderful voice and that wonderful talent of yours is, 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 is highlighted throughout this one half a piece of content. But content is still and remains a big factor in us knowing and uh, us getting a, a, a version of you that is compelling. Where we say to ourselves like, oh, wow, this, I like this. Let me listen to the next record. Remember, one fan at a time. Hook them with one and then keep on, keep on. And, you know, pay close attention to, uh, to, 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 to what your aesthetic is. You know, for some people, that's a thing where it's like, you know, you can either go raw and just, you know, throw the music out and just kind of just it's you voice and, and visual, or you can keep something consistent. You can have the same background. You can, you know, kind of just approach it from a different, different angles and what have you, or, or, but to each his own. So, um, that, I, that right there is, is, um, is one of the things of, well, probably one of the many things that it takes, uh, for an artist to stand out in this day and age. Arthur Lewis, shout out to Arthur Lewis, man. Super talented. Hi Riggs, good to see you. Thanks for doing this. Just spoke about this question a little, but what do you think is the role of folks who aren't interested in being big artists themselves, who want to be songwriters, producers, vocal arrangers in the development of a new artist? That's an excellent question, uh, Arthur. And again, um, there are so many uh, occupations within the music business that will allow you to utilize your talents within the music business that doesn't necessarily find you being an artist. There are songwriters, there are studios, there are engineers, there is a, you know, there's product managers, these are marketing, you know, these are the folks responsible for the entire project. And what this person does is make sure that everything is running on all cylinders. Who's everything? The video department, the streaming department, the live, the, the, the live performance department, and making sure everything's running on and and that in itself, that's just one of the many occupations. Uh, and opportunities available for folks in the music business. I think um, if you know what you're doing and you, you, you know what you're talking about, and maybe there's a proof of concept in addition to your hunger and your talent that shows the opportunity will present itself. But um, you know, I, for one, as an a and I'm always on the lookout for the next songwriter, for the next producer. I'm not trying to get online uh, in line rather, uh, waiting for the next big producer who I wouldn't mind, but by the time I get to him, you know, that sounds already kind of either watered down or he just didn't deliver the way we had hoped because he's more of a name than it is a sound. So I'm always looking for who the next person is. And I've always prided myself in taking meetings with, you know, I'm not gonna say just about anybody, but you just never know. Uh, whenever somebody lets off some inkling of talent, I think it's imperative that I dive into it a little bit more and just look under the hood a bit to see what this person is capable of. You just never know. Um, a recent example, um, I think it was Harry Styles. The last Harry Styles album was actually produced by, I believe, the engineer who worked on the previous album with the big, big producer. So, you know, this, ver this, this last Harry Styles album, for anybody who's into Harry Styles, um, was actually a very, very good album and that, there was a comfortability there developed between the engineer who just happens to be a producer and Harry who's in the studio with the, who, who he's in the studio with all the time. And just like, really there's a, there was a report built there that eventually led to a couple of wonderful records. And I believe a Grammy, a Grammy win as well. So um, let's see. 2005, 2009 was a difficult time for you, but through innovation and leading to M's recovery. Can you talk about believing in your, ah, can you talk about believing in your vision and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Thank you very much. I'm gonna show something to you guys, right? So this is a, a blank page. It's a blank, I don't know if you can see it, but anyways, I'm gonna try to make this work. Um, So um, when anything you set your sights on and any dream that you have, um, it is going to be a process to get there. It is going to be a journey. How you come out of that journey is how you handle that journey is gonna be just as important as you finishing that journey. And then throughout that process is where you really just start 
really looking at things from a slew of different angles. So I hope that this can actually be shown here. I'm gonna try to do something where, nope, 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 this ain't it. Nope, this ain't it. Uh, wow, did not know. Ah, yeah, something like this. This is kind of crazy. It's too bad you guys can't see it all that well. Um, nope, this ain't working. In any event, what I basically did was it was a line, right? It was a line that you start here and then you go down, you go down, you go down, you go down. That's about five years. And then you start making, you cut the, you turn the corner and start some sort of development takes place. Something really key starts to happen. And then you keep going, you keep going, you kind of stay in that place for a second. And then at some point you're waiting for it to turn the corner. And when it turns the corner, that in itself could be a one year, seven months, two years, you just don't know. It's throughout that pace, it's throughout that journey of trying to turn the corner that you're gonna get tested. You're gonna go through your periods where you really start questioning like, man, is this worth it? My parents are on my ass, I'm not really making any money. Like you're gonna go through these questions and you're gonna start doubting yourself. And, and it's one of those things where you really have to decide like after all the hard work that you've put in that's led to you, this, that's led you this far, do you keep going or do you tap out? And I'm gonna encourage you not to tap out. You have to keep going because no matter what, you know, um, that's just life. Nothing is set on the table for you. You have to go out and get it, at least for folks, for certain folks, you know, more often than not. Um, and believing in what it is that you want to accomplish is a very big factor. When I decided I wanted to be an A&R, notice that I'd had to do five years as a music journalist, which wasn't the intention to get to be an A&R. So sometimes you're going to find an entry point to get to this destination, but it's gonna, it's not gonna be in, in the entry point into that particular uh, space or that particular genre or that particular occupation. I know some great folks that started off in one area and eventually evolved into another. And a lot of that had to do with belief, um, you know, and just having a good, uh, a good um, network of people around you. I've always, uh, I've always encouraged folks like, stop trying to chase the boss. If you're good, the boss is gonna notice you. Who you need to be chasing is either the boss's assistant or the guy interning with the boss or anybody that you would just, you're in the same draft class. Some of, the, some of my best relationships in this business are with people who I came up with around a time period. Uh, one of my favorite ones is a gentleman by the name of Mr. Morgan, who when I was interning at the Source Magazine, he was answering phones at, at some music company uh, down the block from me. Now I'm senior vice president of a and at Atlantic Records and he is the GM and run, helps run OVO for Drake. Um, and Laz Alonzo, an actor, very, very accomplished actor who you've seen in a slew of, of really awesome shows and, and films, including The Fast and the Furious. I remember as an intern, he was selling ads at the source uh, by the Xerox machine. And I would ask him, what are you trying to be? You know, I want to be an actor. I was like, oh, cool. I want to be an a and And here we are years later, looking back, like we set out and we did it. Um, it's not an easy thing. It's just not. So if you really, you really have to start by having some sort of belief in you and what you're looking to accomplish. And that's going to be the driver from when you're running out of gas, ironically, you know? So, um, Something to keep in mind for anybody out there looking to get into the music business and just like, whether it's as an artist, as an executive, like you got to keep shipping away because if not, all that hard work that you built to get there might be for nothing, but don't let it be for nothing. So um, let's see, any example of an artist that walked in with the radio ready hit record, but low numbers on social media? Any examples of artists that walked in with a radio? You know what? Yeah, I thought about that recently. Um, I can't pinpoint a particular artist, but I find it ironic that some of the artists that come in with the record that you swear is a hit just isn't. It just isn't. I remember um, there was a, an awesome, talented individual by the name of Ify, who I had found uh, while I was at Shady. And I heard this record that he played me was a demo. It was a one-time listen. I said, oh my God, this is a hit. This is, this is it right here. So got him a situation um, because Shady didn't do, uh, uh, Shady didn't do pop. 
got him a situation. And surprisingly, the label signed him based off that one-time listen infectiousness of the record and never heard from him again. And it wasn't to say that, it wasn't to say that, that the music wasn't good and that the artist wasn't good. It just didn't connect. And that does happen. Um, I sit on a bunch of demos to this day. Like I'm always looking and listening to music where I'm just like, oh my God, this is such a hit if the right person gets on it. But that doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen that way. Ultimately, who's going to determine it's a hit is you, the public. The public decides that. Um, so that right there is something to, uh, to keep in mind because I think ultimately the public is going to decide uh, how far uh, you'll end up going um, as an artist. Um, so any example of artists, oh, sorry, wrong question. How has the COVID-19 health crisis changed the landscape of the music industry? Significantly. Um, one of the first questions that I asked when this first happened was, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Because this is a business that is rooted in the mind. The artist's mind has to be in a good space to create something substantial or something that connects. So a, 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 a pandemic hit, then we had social justice issues that were on front street in front of everyone. So it's like, it's gonna have its effect. I don't wanna hear you popping bottles in the club when this is happening. So how, how is this as a creative affecting you? Um, and that's the question I would pose. And you know, I wasn't able to just get on a plane um, uh, to, to go out and then engage an artist the way I normally would. I like to be face to face and just have a conversation so I could really get a feel of what this artist and the team is about. You had, you know, the music coming back from this time period was a little dark, you know, because that's it was a sign of the times. So, um, and I haven't been into my office in the last year and then a year, yeah, in the last since, yeah, about a year, a year and change. Um, that background you see there, that is my office. At least it looks like, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, and I haven't been able to socialize and been around, you know, this, this vibrant group of people who I love to just, you know, vibe off of like, hey, let me play you this. What do you think of that? And just like that, that plays a, a big role. Uh, and and that, that social component plays a big role. Um, so now, it has had its effect, but now things are on the up and up. I still think folks are going about it cautiously. Um, studio sessions, that's another thing that took a hit, you know, the ability to get in and create with folks. Uh, something you'd like to do one-on-one -on -one, face to face now has to be done virtually, uh, not, as, not as engaging. I don't know that you get great music out of that process, but things are loosening up now. We're definitely heading towards some sort of normalcy. But um, we are still in the process of the effects that COVID had on the music business. So uh, let's see, what else do we have? Can you walk us through the evolution of how you discovered artists? How do you do it now versus when you started out? Great question. Um, so music discovery in general, there's just so much music in the landscape right now. So much music where I'm going to always rely on good old fashioned word of mouth. At the same time, I have to take into account where we're at at the times. We now have the resources to be able to pinpoint something that has activity or some sort of, some sort of, of, of trajectory uh, early. A problem is everyone has those resources. So, um, you know, every major label has a high power research department that's just honing in on making sure that they find the next big thing. That's the easy part. The difficult part is breaking an artist. Breaking meaning taking the artist from viral sensation to something much more bigger where even your parents know who it is, um, or who he or she is, or who the act is. So, um, you know, the process isn't really all that different from back in the days where it just speaks to you, except now you have to do an enormous amount of due diligence to make sure that this isn't what you like and what's going to work are just two different things. Oh, I love this right here, but this speaks to me at 11 o'clock at night. This is not something that's going to end up, you know, playing on the radio uh, 20, 20 hours, you know, throughout the day. Uh, or being streamed, you know, because radio is kind of like a obsolete thing for some of you young kids. But um, so, um, yeah, the process is still word of mouth. Um, there is going to be, you know, data that comes back to me and good old fashioned buzz. 
Um, the thing is now everyone has binoculars that are going to hone in on whatever this buzz is, you know? Um, and I think there is, you know, a big disconnect between buzz and good. You know, like because it's buzzing, there's a reason why it's buzzing, and it's not always music based. Um, and then there's, you know, it actually being good, uh, and who's going to determine whether or not it is even good is uh, you as the public. So, uh, connected to that question, is there a path an artist should follow to get connected with someone in AR? Is it more that AR finds you? I think it's a little bit of both, but keep in mind that out of the 60 or so people on here, everyone's looking for me or people in my position. So I'm already gonna have a bit of a wall and my ears are numb because all I'm doing is listening to music. The good stuff has my ear ringing. So I'm gonna listen. And if it rings, I'm gonna go ahead and inquire about it a little bit more and say to myself, hey, so look into this, is this person signed, yada, yada. And just like really just do my due diligence, you know? But um, we are not so easy to find because everyone has someone or knows someone who's talented. Um, most of my followers on Instagram, which you can follow me on Riggy Smalls, uh, R-I-G-G-Y Smalls, most of them are aspiring artists. Um, same thing with Twitter, which is uh, Riggs Morales one. And, um, you know, unfortunately not everyone is going to be given, you know, a shot. Um, and there's some people that, uh, some artists, aspiring artists are just very diligent super diligent you know i have one gentleman who's been you know really almost stalking me um for like the last two years and um it's unfortunate because that's it's, it's, it's not really the way to go just stalking someone to to just having them hear your music at the same time you just never know and you know like I, one day you know out of the many sometimes i'll just randomly press play out of someone who's just sending me a random demo. And sometimes it sounds like straight crap that's been done in the bedroom. Other times, oh, there's something here. And guess what? I'm gonna call and I'm gonna share some thoughts with you. I'm gonna have you just here. Sit with this, food for thought, you do the dishes. And you know, if something comes out of there, cool. If not, at least I was able to share with you some perspective that hopefully can allow you to go to the next level. So, um, can you talk about some of the social work you do with the Recording Academy and how one could get involved if they're a member? Yes, um, I am a proud member of the Recording Academy. I have been working with the Recording Academy since I was qualified to work with the Recording Academy back in 2010. And um, I was a member, I am a member of the New York chapter where I served as vice president, I served as governor and, and, and trust, and now I serve as a trustee. What is a trustee? Trustee is one of the 40 people representing uh, the entire recording academy in a room that just really decides, or at least helps make the decisions that are gonna take the recording academy um, in, in, the, in the right direction. Um, again, I represent New York, but uh, one of the more significant contributions or happenings uh, for me within the Recording Academy was uh, the creation of the Black Music Collective. It was an idea that I came up with that ensured my community was spoken to. Uh, I felt there was a disconnect between the Recording Academy and hip hop and R&B music, and I thought it was a fixable one. I'm not one to complain about the problem and I have some sort of solution. So I came up with a solution. I presented it to the right folks. It gained some traction. Uh, and here we are. Uh, it is now a very significant part of the Recording Academy. And one that really assures that a lot of really talented folks don't get overlooked. Uh, and when I say that the disconnect was there, the disconnect, uh, it was just as simple as understanding, but also it goes the other way as well, where you want to make sure that the recording, the, the Black music community is familiar with the process of the Recording Academy. So I find myself and many others in the, in the, in the, in the Black Music Collective just helping to educate uh, creatives that are qualified to be members. You know, if you, uh, if you have a certain amount of credits and you have someone vouch for you, um, you can become a member, a voting member. You know, um, and those are the things that uh, I think, you know, are going to help put the Recording Academy in a much better space with this community in general. Because um, over in the past, there's been things that were just, you know, kind of come off as slaps in the face. But it was also a case of no one really telling them, like, you know, um, you need to acknowledge uh, 
guru from Gangstar uh, of, uh, in the in memoriam um, because he passed away. He was very significant to us. He may not have been too much uh, in, in, in your uh, landscape, but in hip hop, he's a certified legend. So, um, and here we are. So, um, and that right there is, is definitely some of the more, some of the more fulfilling work um, that I've been doing with the Recording Academy. Um, lots of people are asking about NFTs and your thoughts on those and the role they play. Uh, interesting, NFTs just seem like they're here. Uh, no different than cryptocurrency, I would think. And that's one where I'm gonna actually have to wait. And, I'm literally looking at NFTs as a wait and see thing. Um, I want to see how, you know, because it works for, it, it seems to work for very established artists or artists with a hardcore fan base, you know, so I want to see some of the NFTs that are going to become available on artists that that really, you know, something from Radiohead, uh, something Eminem, I know recently did one. Um, I'd like to see what an NFT from MF Doom, try saying that three times, looks like. So um, that's really one where I, for one, full on, honestly, and doing a wait and see thing. Uh, in a way where, you know, it seems like it's here. I want to know if it's permanent. Um, so, because that's one of the things throughout COVID, like that's, that was one of the standout um, uh, revelations was NFTs. So um, let's see, you know, I don't want to sit here and speak on it as some sort of an expert, but I know it is definitely a big factor and one that I'm curious to see where it goes. So uh, you talked about building an artist who... You talked about building on artists who have a viral moment, but you believe in producing the original cast of Hamilton album. How do you balance believing in your ears versus passion and trends? Awesome question. That was one of the first lessons I had to learn as an a &R early on, where it's just like, all right, I love this. This is great. This is the greatest underground rap group ever. I want to sign them. But guess what? A reminder, this is the music business. Um, you know, like business, you want to make sure that what you're signing is going to bring in some sort of revenue for the company that invested in it. That's just the reality of it. Um, but what happens is that music itself is just such a thing that's embedded in our DNA and our brains is something that's just, it's just, it's, it's everything. It's an energy. Um, but that energy needs to translate to selling records. So I had to learn that early on, just finding that balance, you know, um, Hamilton is one where, you know, I'm, it, it just proves my point. Dope sells itself. Um, you can't, you couldn't have listened to Hamilton the first time around and I say to yourself, wow, this is dope. Like, this is new. This is, I've never seen anything like this. And there's something to be said for that. And I, for one, when I look for artists, I look for those little unique traits that nobody else has. Voice, perspective, um, approach. Um, and I've never, ever heard anything like that in my life. And, you know, you hope that it does well because Broadway cast albums don't normally, you know, do all that well to bring in revenue for the, for the record labels. But in this case, it was like, all right, if at the very least I can have kids listen to this and this is available for kids to hear and they could learn their first glimpse of history hip hop, R&B, Broadway musicals, all in one mission accomplished. And it's gone way beyond that, thank God. Um, and a lot of that had to do with just really believing in it. I truly believe that this was a very special piece of art. And then from there, you know, convincing everyone else that that was the case, you know, um, got us to this place where we're now, as of last Tuesday, we sold over 8 million copies of the Hamilton cast album. and. Um, proud to say the one thing that always you know the best part is when you hear parents saying I listen to it in the car with my kids that's great because that was the whole goal was make sure sonically you sat in this place where no one's getting on each other's nerves <laughs> the rap has to listen to it and then you know the the musical the music aficionados aficionados uh can, can vibe to it as well so um Cool. Uh, let's see. Trying to see what else. Uh, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. Um, trying to find some more questions to answer for you guys. We did NFTs. Uh, we did. 
Let's see. Let's top three skills. It's, ah, good one from Cappy Ramsey. What are the top three skills you believe are essential for someone to gain a role in a &R, assuming they already have plenty of experience in the recorded music business? I think taste, foresight, belief, an understanding of how the market works and what's trending and what have you. Um, I think you have to really pay close attention to what's going on because it moves so fast. Um, I, for one, when it comes to my interns, I like speaking with music. I like to look to my right and know that I'm speaking to a music person. Um, because if you're working under me, you're supposed to be me in the next couple of years. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see signs and hints of that. And a lot of that is through conversation. So there's something like a Playboy Cardi. I'm just like, why are people like Playboy Cardi? Like, what is it with this? Like, why? I need you as the more younger and more in, in tune with what's going on to school me on it. Once I'm schooled on it and I'm downloaded on what that is, my whole brain just wires and says, oh, okay, cool. Which is why I have a higher tolerance level for what's going on today than most of my peers in the same age group. They just quit. They're just like, nah, this ain't for me. I'm like, nah, I gotta understand it. I may not like it, but I have to understand it. So um, I think um, diligence, um, tenacity, follow through, um, make yourself valuable um, uh, to whatever the opportunity presents itself. If you're in the studio working underneath an engineer. Make yourself valuable there, um, however you can, but you do have to have a passion and an understanding for music. There's a music part of it, then there's a music business part of it. So remember for like every single, every song that's out there, there's about five, 10 different people involved in it. That's why I used to love reading credits. So I, I highly recommend for folks to read the credits and then from there go on a deep dive of uh, who some of these contributors are, who some of these people are that help put these records together. That's one of the fun parts I still do. Uh, I was doing it before I was an intern. I was doing it while I was an intern. I was doing it while I was you know, in, in this career path. And I do it now to this day. And if I hear a song that I like, for example, I was listening to the Olivia Rodrigo album. Yes, the Olivia Rodrigo album. And like, wow, who did this? Who produced this? Who was it that she found to get in sync with her and just really convey this super letter in the form of 11 songs to her ex-boyfriend. And it was a fella by the name of, I uh, forget his last name, uh, something Negro, right? Or Nigro. And when I went and did my due diligence on him, you see like, oh, wow, he's put in work. He's done all these things here and there. And I guess all of it led to this. Just like say, for example, Paul Epsworth, Paul Epsworth, who produced Adele's 21 album, or at least Rolling in the Deep, was already putting in time, little placement here, little placement there. And all it took was one, all it took was one artist for them to be in sync with. And all of a sudden, everybody knows who Paul Epsworth is. So really, I enjoy reading credits, Wikipedia pages, the whole nine yards, that kind of deep dive, that rabbit hole is the best. You could do it with all creatives too. You could do it with stylists, you could do it with, you know, um, you know, speakers, you could do it with well, whomever, you know? So um, uh, let's see, you have recommended three really good books that I ordered to read. Outliers, Appetite for Self-Destruction, The Big Payback, The History. Oh, okay, cool, yeah, that's another big thing. I'm, uh, there was a history before us. So uh, highly recommend, you know, whenever you get a chance, just go back and do your history um, and just see what happened to get us to where we're at now. Um, you'll notice some things just never change, you know, for the good of the word, for, for the good of the bad, some things just never change. So just having that kind of understanding um, helps enormously. So uh, I'm going to see if I can find some more questions here. Let's see. Uh, oh, I got one here. What is a typical budget when signing a new artist? It depends. If you're walking in with some sort of buzz and some sort of an advantage, it's a pretty healthy budget. Somewhere in the high six figures, or maybe even the mid six figures. It really depends because budgets are broken down in a variety of ways. There's the advance that goes in the pocket of the artist, which you have to pay back. FYI. And then there's the marketing budget. The marketing budget is the money that's going to be spent to promote your music. So um, 
a deal's range. If you have a substantial amount of buzz and every other label's going after you, you can walk in with an advantage. And with that advantage, you know, you can pretty much write your own ticket um, and, 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 and go from there. Or, you know, prefer, me, pref, me preferably, I like the cash things early and cheap. Um, because again, I'm very much into artist development. And just to be clear, I'll, I'll close out with this. Artist development comes in so many different stages. Like even if you're an established artist, you still need to develop your relevancy. Like you wanna make sure you stay hot in the marketplace. So even if you're someone accomplished like a Wiz Khalifa or, or an Eminem or someone like that, like you still need hits, you still need music to make sure that you are on the, uh, on the radar of this very fast moving climate. You know, one of the chances that I had in doing that with Eminem after years of working with Eminem, I worked for Eminem, but never had the chance to work with Eminem. And how I, let me break that down. It means that as an A&R, it was only Dr. Dre and Eminem. That is it, nobody touches that process. But then it got to a place where Dr. Dre went off to do headphones and M needed a new sound. And when the, I got the call to uh, send over some tracks, I sent over who I think might make some sense for where he's at at the moment. And that led to some really awesome records being made. One of them being Love the Way You Lie. Um, and again, goes back to You Never Know. I honed in on Alex the Kid early who went on to become one of the biggest producers in music. And um, that a lot of that had to do with just me digging, diving in who produced this and just recommendations, just doing my due diligence. Um, all that to say that, <clears throat> excuse me, all that to say is that, um, you know, everything, it, 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 um, the, art, the development process, there's no limit to it, um, whether it's at a, at an at a embryo stage where we want to get you to the next level, or even if you're super established, you sell millions of records, but you're trying to figure out, you know, how can you stay afloat? That is development. And uh, it is a wonderful thing and something that I'm really happy and, and proud to be involved in. And the most rewarding part of this whole thing is just seeing something start from an embryo all the way to the point where you're buying it. So um, it's a high like nothing else. I, I, I will tell you that right now. You're standing next to something that's just like, wow, we believed in this from the beginning, you know, and um, here we are. Now the whole world sees it. So um, seeing if there's anything else. Cool, you're welcome, Kathy Ramsey. Uh, what's the way, oh, what's the best way to stretch a 10K budget over a 10 song project? I would say bit by bit. Uh, give people nuggets. 10 songs, do you have to put out the whole project or you want to do two at a time, three at a time? Stretch it out. That's how you stretch it out. You know, and when you have, in, 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 in regards to, to, to financial investment in your music, be very, be, be understandably frugal with it. Like, you know, try to find the cheapest studio you can or invest in yourself and learn the traits yourself. Um, there's a lot of platforms and a lot of applications, a lot of, a lot of software that can allow you to do everything on your own, at least until you get to that place. And I think that part and you learning that part is a huge factor, just understanding what works for you and yourself as an artist. You know, I didn't realize till I got into certain studios that Jay-Z and Eminem and then they, they use a certain mic, a very expensive microphone that, that, that if you know, what you what works for you that's the microphone that you want so um yeah that's uh, that's how i would say stretching out here's the other thing i do right instead of 10 grand cut it in half you got 10 grand put five away stretch that five out okay with that five really is where you start stretching out you know the, the, the most that getting the most out of it so i do that even to this day with big budgets i cut it in half where it's just like, let's make believe because we're going to need this down the line. Let's make, but let's see how far we can get with what we have here. And if we have to go a little bit further and dip into it, then fine, so be it. But let's get to that place and let's be real strict about it. Would a background in artist management help in pursuing a role as an a &R? Uh Absolutely. Yes. Uh, because as a manager, you're really getting into the nuances of the business nice and early. So um, that's a very good skill set uh, that I didn't mention early on. Um, because managers, their job is to make sure the business is handled. Uh, and, a, and a dual threat is when you have a manager that really understands music. So when you have both, 
uh, that's a hybrid, that's, that's a problem right there. So um, a lot of great managers uh, do both. So you're welcome, Greg. Uh, let's see. Five, so, um, unless anybody has any other questions, I don't have, uh, I'm going to probably close out and, and saying that um, everyone on this call, the fact that you're on this call is already a step in the right direction. Um, cause I sent this out, I put this on my social network and, you know, you hope that folks turn up, but, uh, you turning up reminds me of when I first, there was something like this back in my time, back in my time, uh, back in my time where it was at a library. Somebody just took the time out of their schedule to teach people about the music business. And it was like an hour class. And I went, it was all the way in the Bronx, which is way far from, from where I was living at, at the time in Harlem. So the fact that you're here is already a step in the right direction. So um, I hope, and I, and I say this to anyone on here, I hope that when you see me or we run into each other, that you said, hey, I was on that virtual powwow that the, the wonderful city of New York and the mayor's office put together. Because I'm going to reference that as, oh, you really care. Cool. What are you working on? What are you up to? What did you think? And then we'll just talk. I'll lend you five minutes. It's not a problem. So uh, yeah, that is uh, that is basically it. I really hope this is helpful. Uh, shout out to all of you for even showing up. Arthur, get at me if you're still on here. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope this is helpful, guys. I, I, I look forward to running into some of you guys in the future. So cool. You're welcome, Edward. Thank <laughs> you.